So on February 22nd of this year, we saw thousands of teachers across the state of West Virginia walk out of their public schools. It was the first statewide teacher walkout in 28 years. For nine days, they protested against the rising cost of health insurance and low teacher pay. And with the support of superintendents across 55 districts in the state, along with bus drivers and custodians and parents and teachers, those teachers won not only a pay raise for themselves, but for other state employees. It's not so much the raise, said one West Virginia teacher, as much as it is the respect that we deserve. Or, as another teacher said on her sign at the state capitol, I paid for this sign with my other job, so come <laughs> on, Congress, we taught you better. <laughs> and a little more than a month after that, um, of this year, we saw 30,000 teachers in Oklahoma also crowd their state capitol to protest not only low teacher pay, but inadequate funding for schools. Despite the critics of the walkouts in that state, we saw community workers and teachers and volunteers organize activities to support children during the walkout. Nutrition workers, they converted cafeterias into mobile food delivery systems, packing 17,000 sack lunches uh, for delivery. We saw teenagers volunteering to work with young people in youth centers and in libraries. And it was clear in Oklahoma that a teacher rebellion did not mean student neglect. And after nine days, teachers in Oklahoma won pay raises not only for themselves, but for hundreds of paraprofessionals, as millions of dollars in funding for, and resources for kids. We saw a sick out campaign also in Kentucky, forcing 30 districts to cancel classes, and they also headed to the state capitol. And here in Colorado in late April, teachers in this state forced nearly 27 districts to cancel classes as those teachers walked out of their schools and headed to the state capitol joined also by nearly 10,000 teachers not too far away in Arizona who also marched uh, demanding more school funding and better pay. And I must say Colorado's protest signs were the best. Um, <laughs> one, teacher, one sign said that if the Broncos were ranked 46 out of 50, we would pay attention to that. <laughs> and of course, because it's Colorado, there were many signs that said, where's the weed money, man? <laughs> and most recently, we saw in Raleigh, North Carolina, we saw teachers, 15,000, walk out of their schools in a march they call the March for Students and the Rally for Respect. Like many of you, as a former teacher and now education policy researcher here at CU Boulder, I am proud of our nation's teachers, and I am inspired to stand with them as they demand respect and support in both tangible and intangible ways. In the past weeks, however, I have wondered if after the victories, however small or long overdue they are, what is next and what is the it? I'm having a Betty for Dan moment for activists, like, <laughs> is this all? Um, and so what will be the political significance of the teacher walkouts a year from now, five years from now, or 10 years from now? What victories will this generation of teachers have secured and for who? So I can't tell the future or what that future holds, but I can look to the past, both recent and distant past. From the recent past, we saw in Wisconsin, um, in 2011, we saw teachers fight a bitter struggle against their governor, who really attacked collective bargaining rights um, and the right to organize and collect dues. And only six years ago, in Chicago in 2012, we saw Chicago teachers engage in a nine-day strike against a mayor who controlled the city schools and oversaw some of the largest massive school closings in that city, schools that served largely African-American communities and displaced children of whom nearly 80% were black, all while courting groups to manage newer schools and private managers of those schools. In Chicago, though, we did see that the struggles of teachers who felt disenfranchised and disrespected was bound up with students who were fighting for their schools and who also felt dis uh, disenfranchised and disrespected. So in Colorado, there are similar signs that the struggles of teachers are closely intertwined with the struggles of students who need equitable public schools. So I just want to share some interesting findings from one of my favorite policy institutes, second only to the National Education <laughs> Policy Center that is my favorite center, which is located here in CU Boulder in Colorado. But the Learning Policy Institute has developed some very handy charts 
to help us understand the relationship between what teachers are fighting for and what students are also needing. And so they developed a teaching attractiveness rating. And it is not a study of how well or how attractive you think your teacher is. <laughs> it is about how attractive the teaching profession is. And they sort of average a composite of a number of qualities where they ask teachers about salary, wage competitiveness, uh, job security, uh, a number of things, teacher turnover. And of an average composite of one through five, with one being the lowest and five being the highest, Colorado ranked a two for teacher attractiveness. But as troubling as this is, there is also a rating for teacher equity. Um, and in that rating, um, it's a composite that looks at um, how equally distributed quality teachers are, teachers who are certified and experienced. And it turns out that when the state and the, the district sort of falls or drops the ball on teacher attractiveness, the students who suffer the most are our students who have the highest needs. They are most likely to get teachers who are inexperienced, who are uncertified, um, who have high turnover rates. And then also the composite includes teachers of color. Um, it turns out that teachers of color are a resource for a growing diverse uh, student body. Um, and so of this composite, for Colorado with uh, between one and five, with one being the lowest and five being the highest, the equity rating was 1.3. So there is a relationship between the lack of attractiveness for this profession and our ability to have equally distributed, highly qualified teachers across schools. Also, um, I think we can learn from our contemporaries as well. We see young people engaging in walkouts all across the country including our Parkland students who are pushing, um, who encourage and inspire state walkouts for gun control and gun reform. We have students who've engaged in sit-ins and teach-ins about immigration rights um, and pushing to renew DACA. Also uh, supporting our religious minority students, as well as our Black Lives Matter movement that we've seen actually happen for six years now since the murder of Trayvon Martin, which is against the state-sanctioned racialized violence against people of color. So what does this stuff have to do with the teachers who are walking out? We know historically that it is social movements that change laws and policies, as well as culture and entrenched forms of power. And if we want the culture of blame and disrespect of teachers, as well as austerity and disinvestment in public institutions and public sector workers, if we want that to change, we might need to think in terms of a broader social movement. And oddly enough, 50 years ago, in 1968, it was a year that was described as the year that the world caught fire. There were anti-war protests, protests uh, for women's rights, black power movement, um, uh, protests for uh, racially desegregated schools, and even in Colorado, there were demands for more equitable bilingual education in the state. So those struggles were undoubtedly painful and long and sometimes peaceful and sometimes not. But as an African-American woman, the daughter of parents from the South who witnessed and endured those struggles, their sacrifices were a gift to me, this generation. Not a perfect gift, but a gift. So what if teacher walkouts today were viewed as part of a larger social movement, a year that the world caught fire again, particularly in November, when it's time to vote again in our midterm elections? What if teachers today looked back to 1968 and to 2012 in order to move forward with bigger and bigger demands that challenge threats to organized labor, to racial uh, equality and inclusion, or that challenge the idea of public education altogether in the face of privatization? What if we remember that public schools before the near obsession with testing and job preparation, what if we remember that public schools were also places to build civic capacity critical thinking, and to prepare for and protect our democracy? What if teachers this year leverage their recent victories to support other groups that have not yet had a victory and who do not yet feel respected in and out of schools? And what if teachers joined with activists and community organizers in a bigger tent to socially reimagine the world with radical possibilities? What if? My hope is that the activities of this year bear lasting fruit for future generations of teachers, where teachers are policymakers who regularly run for office, where teachers feel like a part of a professional community, where teachers regularly join with activists um, and routinely 
speak out against issues of racism and misogyny and xenophobia and heterosexism? What if teachers were as racially diverse as the students in their classrooms? Wow. And, and I do hope that the teachers continue to win bigger and bigger wins that are both tangible and intangible. And I'll just end with my summer plans. The summer is coming soon, or it's already here for a lot of us. <laughs> and I know that for teachers, summer is not off. It's just when your side job becomes like your main job for like the whole you know, summer. But I do hope that this is a summer where teachers continue to find spaces to organize, to strategize for bigger goals, and that they connect their goals to other communities that are struggling. So I'll be spending a portion of my summer at the Highlander Folk School. I'm excited because it's a space that was started in the 30s. It's been organizing workers in the South for many years. Um, it's also the summer where Rosa Parks spent um, that year in 1954 before she sat down on that bus in September. She was studying civil disobedience, and she was studying organizing. Um, and many people have passed through this space, including MLK and Paolo Freire, for those of us who study critical education. And I passed through it last year. Uh, and I also took a selfie, because that's just what you have to do. Uh, and I also was able to work with other people who were organizing, um, people across the South, uh, women who are organizing um, in different sectors, not just as teachers. And so I encourage teachers to continue building, to continue imagining. And I'll just end with this one last sign that was actually on a protest sign in Oklahoma, is that I'm sorry for the inconvenience. We're just trying to change the world. <laughs>